Tonight on the Worldview Weekend Hour, Lesson 5 in our series on Revelation. Tonight we look at the Redeemer of Revelation. The Worldview Weekend Hour begins right now. WVW-TV presents the Worldview Weekend Hour with Brandon House. Whether the topic is law, science, government, economics, history, family, social issues, education, or theology, Brennan brings the issues of today into clear focus through the lens of a biblical worldview. And now, here is your host, Brennan House. Good evening and welcome to the broadcast. Glad you are with us. Here we are tonight, Sunday night, April 28th, April 28th, 2024, exactly 8 o'clock Central Time on the dot. Yep, we're live and we're here pretty much every Sunday night other than we have to take off occasionally. Mother's Day's coming up, you know, different holidays. I had a little traveling I had to do last week. Other than that, we try to be very consistent in our study here on Sunday night. We've been teaching this Sunday night church service since 2015. And we hope you're telling your family and friends about it far and wide, available at worldviewtube.com. If they don't catch it live, of course, they can catch it on the replay. Broadcast there for them on demand at worldviewtube.com. If you have a Bible nearby, grab it. But if you don't, we'll put the verses up on the screen. Remember, we started out lesson one with this, the, re the relevance of Revelation, the relevance of Revelation. And we looked at all the things going on in the world and how relevant this book is. And of course, we also went then to lesson two, the rewards of revelation. A lot of blessings, a lot of rewards for those who seek to understand this book. The only book in the Bible that I'm aware of that actually speaks to the fact there's a special blessing for those who not only seek to understand it, but who read it, who hear it. Lesson two was the rewards of revelation. We had to continue that to lesson three, the rewards of revelation. Lesson four was the reveals of Revelation. We looked at the things that the book of Revelation was going to be revealing to us, and here we are now on lesson five. Tonight we're going to look at the Redeemer of Revelation, the Redeemer of Revelation. Tonight it's going to be a very encouraging study for you because we're going to talk about, well, what this main, what this book is really about, the main, the main focus of this book, which is Jesus Christ. Many people make it about the Antichrist or the plagues or the judgments. Uh, or whatever it might be, but the emphasis should be on what we're going to focus on tonight, the Redeemer of Revelation. If you have your Bible, go to Revelation chapter 1. Let's pick it up at about verse 9. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Here's what we read. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Let's stop right there. What tribulation? It's not the tribulation period yet. This is the beginning of the book, so he's talking about, I, John, I'm, I'm your brother in Christ, and just like you, I have tribulation. And, and boy, did he, right? Here he is writing on the island of Patmos. He's been thrown onto that island because he was preaching the gospel, and the leader of Rome did not like that one bit. And so he's thrown out there on the island of Patmos, and so he knows all about tribulation. And he says, I was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what... What's it say next? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Some people say, oh, look, this book was written. Um, he's talking about this Lord's day, Sunday. So he's writing this book. It starts out on Sunday, writing this book. That's not at all what this is saying. Oftentimes we do refer to Sunday as the Lord's day, but that's not what it, it's saying here at all. What this is saying is, in fact, is... A, a, a day, the Lord's day, or when God intervenes into the world, oftentimes to bring judgment. When God intervenes into the world, into the history of man, often, of course, the emphasis is being that he's bringing judgment, a day of the Lord. And uh, you can see various days of the Lord throughout the Bible, right? Sodom and Gomorrah, many, many others we could list tonight where we see God intervening into the affairs of this world and bringing judgment. So this is at the beginning. John has been 
transported, if you will, through a vision. He has been taken and he's seeing now the events of this book that are about to unfold, which is God intervening into the affairs of man. And in many regards, obviously, he's bringing judgment. He's going to judge the righteous and the unrighteous. He's going to judge good and evil. He's, there's going to be a battle of, of, of historical and biblical proportions, and God is going to defeat Satan and his enemies, and he is going to eventually establish his kingdom. Daniel 2 tells us God's kingdom come, comes, it crushes Satan's kingdom, and of God's kingdom, there'll be no end. So God is intervening into the affairs of the world, in the affairs of man, and John is starting to see this. He's been given this revelation, i.e. the book, revelation. He's been given this vision. We're going to see that in, as we go through this study. And so this is what it's referring to when it talks about uh, that I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. In fact, here's a great, great quote by the late Pastor John Wolvert. He said, although it's common today to refer to Sunday as the Lord's day, it is not used this way in the Bible. The New Testament consistently refers to Christ's resurrection as occurring on the first day of the week never as the Lord's day. So John was projected forward to the future, to the future day of the Lord, as he received the revelation of the unfolding of the end times. So John is beginning to see God intervening in the affairs of man and the world to bring judgment, a day of the Lord. So let's go back to the text. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to the church of Laodicea. Oh, wow, we're going to have a lot to say about these various churches as we get into our study, are we not? But let's go back to that section of the verse I've underlined. I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. What is this all about? Well, look at what 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. This is not uh, language. This is not language being used by John the Revelator that is uncommon at all. It's already being used in 1 Thessalonians. And so he says again, behind me I heard a loud voice as, a, as of a trumpet. There you go. Now, let's continue. And then he says, and, and this is wonderful, because what we're about to learn is, we're about, we're about to learn a lot about the Redeemer, the risen Lord. John is about to see the risen Lord in a, in a remarkable way. And I think you're going to appreciate what John, by God's grace, allows us to hear and understand. Let's go back to the text. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Now, what is this? This is the Greek, the first and last letters of the alphabet. What does that mean? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He is the totality of all that is. God is outside of time. God created time. God is not bound by time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He's eternal. He's forever. We never have to worry that the Lord is going away. He's not going anywhere. In fact, the text even says the Lord is, is, is resurrected. We don't have to worry that he's ever going to die again. He had a physical death so that he might save us from our sins. He was God incarnate, fully God, fully man. He experienced death as our payment for those who place our faith and trust in him. But we don't have to worry. He's never going to die again. He never has to die again. It was once for all. He laid down his life and he said, it is finished on the cross. Did he not? Debt paid in full. So there are a lot of wonderful promises in this text tonight. He's eternal. He's going nowhere. He is forever. He will never die again. I have to die a physical death that was once. And because of his physical death, fully God, fully man, he is the firstborn. He's the first fruits. 
He has his resurrected body, and he was the first to get it. And guess what? I'm looking forward to that day when I receive my resurrected body. Aren't you? I'm looking forward to that day when we no longer have the curse of sin. We no longer have to say, as it says in Romans chapter 6, what shall we say then? What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? But we have been baptized into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as we place our faith and trust in him. And so we're reading from this book by the Apostle John as he's explaining this, these wonderful characteristics about our Redeemer. So he's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Look at what Hebrews 13.8 says. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His character and his nature does not change. He himself will forever be as he has always been. Let's go back to the text. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia. And then, of course, lays out these seven churches, as we've already read. Now, we're going to get into this a little bit more as to these seven churches. There's a lot to say about those seven churches. In the coming weeks, we will look in great detail at each and every one, and how what they really represent is the church age. The churches from the beginning of the birth of the church and Acts, remember Christ said that he had to go away so the Comforter could come, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the birth of the church, ecclesia, called out ones. I'm not talking about the birth of a 501c3 organization. I'm not talking about the birth or breaking ground of a physical building worth millions of dollars. That was not even going on at this time. They were meeting at this time in home churches, right? With a plurality of teachers. So the church is born in the New Testament. And then we have these seven churches here in the book of Revelation, and we have various types of fruit coming from these churches. We have various types of people. Uh, we have various types of sin. We have one church, particularly Laodicea, that is so bad that Christ is outside knocking to get in, and he says that he would spew them out of his mouth. And so we're going to see the various types of churches represented through these seven churches that we see really through the church age. But then he also says that he has seven stars in his hand. What do those stars represent? We'll get to that. Let's go back to our text. John says, then I turn to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And we're going to get into these seven golden lampstands uh, and what they represent. And just a little hint, what they represent is the church, these seven churches. But not just these seven churches. Please understand, listening friends, not these just these seven churches in Asia that's been already listed, but the church through time. They represent the New Testament church through time from the birth of the New Testament church, the day of Pentecost, and until the day the church is removed. So these seven churches are representative of the churches of the church age. And in the midst of the seven lamps stands one like the Son of Man. One like the Son of Man. What does that mean? That's referring to the deity of Christ. One like the Son of Man, fully God, Holy man, the deity of Jesus Christ. David Hawking, he has sat at this very desk a few years ago, Dr. David Hawking, and we did a whole series on Bible prophecy. We had in studio with us uh, Arnold Frutenbaum, David Hawking. We had with us uh, Tommy Ice. We had with us uh, Ed Heinzen. We had a great conference online right here from this news desk. We broadcast several years ago. And David Hawking, as I said, was one of those men. And here's what David Hawking wrote about this in his book entitled The Book of Revelation, Understanding the Future. He says, quote, A noticeable change has taken place from what the four Gospels describe when they speak of Jesus Christ. This is a picture of what he is like now, that he has risen from the dead. He is not pictured 
He is not pictures in the rob, robe of humanity. It's a typo. He is pictured. He is not pictured in the robe of humanity, but in the garments of royalty. So that's a typo. He is not pictured in the robe of humanity, but in the garments of royalty and deity. He is no longer the humble suffering servant willing to endure the agony and death of a Roman cross. He is now the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has risen from the dead. And the glory he had before, he came into the world in a manger in Bethlehem is now brilliantly displayed. It is a picture of the glory and the greatness. Amen? So he, the text clearly says that he is one like the Son of Man. It really is the Son of Man, the Son of God. And John is seeing him in a remarkable way, a way in which you and I, listening friends, will see him one day. And we too, by the way, will get a resurrected body as well. Well, let's continue. He was clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as the white as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Again, we'll get to that. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Let's go back to the area underlined. He had a garment, folks, down to the feet, and he was girded about the chest with a golden band. What is this? Well, let's go to Exodus chapter 28, verses 2 through 4, because we see this same thing for the high priest, for the priest, for Aaron, right? And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as a priest. Jesus Christ, folks, is our high priest. The Bible says he even makes intercession for us. He prays for us. And he's wearing the, the priestly robe. He's our high priest. He prays for us. He intercedes for us. The Bible says that there is no need for any mediator between God and man, say Christ Jesus. You don't have to go to any human being to confess your sins. You can go right to the throne of God through Jesus Christ, our high priest. And John the Revelator is seeing him, and he's seeing him in his priestly garb, just as we see described for Aaron in Exodus 28. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban and a sash, so they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother and his sons, that he may be to me as priests. So John is telling us what he's wearing. He is no longer the suffering servant. He is the high priest. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he's going to judge. He's a great judge. And he's going to rule. And he's going to reign as the king that he is above all kings. So John's giving us a remarkable picture here. Let's go back to the text. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. Many of you, like myself, raised in the church, probably are used to singing songs about our sins, though they be as scarlet, what? Shall be as white as snow singing hymns that describe our sins being washed away, being as white as snow. That's something very common to us. And of course, it is in the scripture, is it not? Here we have Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This is the holiness of God. Dave, uh, John is describing to us what the King of Kings and Lord of Lords looks like, what he is dressed like, what it symbolizes, what it stands for, and he is holy. And his white hair and his white beard, his white hair and his head, I should say, were like wool. 
as white as snow. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. This speaks of God's, God's judgment. God is a judge. I watched till the thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Isn't this interesting? Because John is reaching back into other scriptures and quoting to us, really, in part, other scriptures. And there in Daniel chapter 7, we see God is being seated as the judge. Of course, Jesus is the God-man. We already, we've already seen in the text, he was the son of man, right? Let's continue. And his eyes like a flame of fire. What does this represent? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3.13. Each one's work, each one's work will be come clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by the by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort that it is. This is not judging whether you're saved or not. This is judging the fruit of the various believers. And what is Jesus doing here? In this passage, as described by John, what he's seeing, Jesus is walking among the churches. So it would make sense that Jesus is not only judging, and he's going to judge, as we see in this text and in this book, the saved and the unsaved. He's also judging the fruit of Christians. He's not just going to judge the unsaved. The unsaved will be judged. We'll see that in the text. And sadly, they will receive eternal judgment and damnation. But we also will see God, Jesus, actually the God-man, judging the fruit of believers. Now, we see in 1 Corinthians, this is not for salvation. The text makes it very clear. It is to see what kind of work you did. Will it burn up? Will it have eternal value? Or will it be of no value? All of us should be producing fruit. Not all of us produce the same amount of fruit, but all Christians should be producing fruit. But some, sadly, produce very, very little. They're saved. They're saved because what is salvation? Salvation is by what? Faith. By faith. It's by grace through faith. Not by works, lest any man should boast. It's a gift from God. So there's justification, instant salvation. And then the next tense. After justification, what? Sanctification, ongoing faithfulness and obedience. And this is where we start producing fruit and eternal fruit as well. Uh, store up your treasures in heaven where moth and dust is not corrupt, right? Eternal fruit, things which have eternal value, preaching the gospel, making disciples, evangelism and discipleship, ministering to the saints, the Bible actually gives a great blessing to those who minister to the Jews who are being slaughtered and persecuted and even in prison during the tribulation period, right? Jesus judges the goats and the sheep, and he puts the sheep on his right hand, and he commends them for doing what? Ministering to their brothers fellow believers, Jews, during the tribulation period. This is eternal fruit. It's not just ministering the gospel and seeing people come to salvation. It's even ministering to fellow believers. And so these people that are doing this are being commended by Christ. We see this in Matthew. And they are storing up eternal fruit and rewards. And 1 Corinthians speaks of this. And their, fru their fruit, their works, will stand the test of Christ. It will not be found wanting. Now, some, it will, but they will not lose their salvation because salvation, again, is by faith alone. And that's justification. And then sanctification. And sadly, some will not have a whole lot to show for their earthly presence. They will not lose their salvation, but they won't have a lot to show for it. 
but each will be judged. So I believe it's very appropriate to speak of the fact that, that Christ is walking among the church and his eyes are like flames of fire. And yes, he's, he's judging, he's testing, he's judging both the saved and the unsaved, but not the saved for salvation. And then the next text, well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 to 31. For if we sin willfully, because here we, here we have judgment of the unsaved. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there, is no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? But we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So yes, God's going to judge the saved and the unsaved, but the unsaved will be judged in a way that is, involves eternal damnation. The saved will be judged in a way that is weighing their fruit and their life's work. So again, there is much to be gleaned from these passages, but at the same time, there's much to rejoice over because for those of us who have placed our faith and trust in Christ, we are passed from judgment into life. So for us as believers tonight, we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear the judgment of God for our eternal souls, but we should be asking ourselves, are, is our life counting for eternity? Are we producing fruit? Because there's going to be rewards at the Bema seat. That's something a lot of churches don't talk about. You ask your family and friends, are you, are you aware of the Bema seat? Have you ever heard of the Bema seat? Very few churches today, very few pastors today teach about the Bema seat, where Christians will be receiving their rewards, where their work will be judged as to whether it was eternal or temporal, spiritual or maternal or material, I should say. So again, much of the church doesn't even know about the Bema Seed, that we should be involved in good works, not for salvation. Our, our works are not the root of our salvation, they're the fruit of our salvation. But sadly, even some Christians produce very little fruit in their life. And they're going to be very sad on the day of the Bema Seed. No, they won't lose their salvation but they will not receive the rewards that others will receive who are persevering and are, are working and laboring, have invested their life in an eternal sense. Let's go back to the text. His feet were like fine brass. What does this mean? Fine brass as if refined in a furnace. Well, Robert L. Thomas, by the way, if you want to get a great commentary on the book of Revelation, I highly recommend you get the commentary, uh, commentaries of uh, Robert L. Thomas. I think there's two of them. There's two of them. Uh, just for the, they're big, thick books. There's two of them that make up the book of Revelation. He is a fine uh, expositor of the Bible, Robert L. Thomas. He says, the total impact of this feature of the description then is to bring attention to Christ's movement among the churches to inculcate purity. Kind of fits with what I was saying a while ago, was it not? Christ moving among the churches, moving among the lampstands that represent the churches, and the various types of churches through the church age. And he's also looking and judging how they're acting, how they're behaving. We're going to see that as we study these individual seven churches. And this is very consistent with what Robert gleaned from the text as well. This inculcation was done by Christ rendering of judgment in cases of moral shortcoming. So, the feet of brass represent the treading down and judgment. His voice as the sound of many waters. John says his voice originally said it sounded like a trumpet. Now he says it sounds like the voice of many waters. It's very loud. I don't fully understand what he's saying here other than to try to tell us in the best language he could come up with as inspired by the Holy Spirit, 
that this was very loud. Verse 10, we saw, I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. But here in verse 15, his voice as the sound of many waters. I don't know, maybe, maybe John is thinking back about the waters crashing on the shores of the island of Patmos, a loud sound. But then look what he says. I, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and we're going to get to that. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment. So we've gone through this. Now going down here to, to verse, to the verse the underlined. After we say, he, his voice as the, was as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. We're going to get to that later. We'll get to that later. We're going to save the lampstands and the stars as we wrap up tonight. But then notice what it says. Out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword. Now, and again, if you have spent a lot of time studying the Bible, particularly those of us raised in the church, memorized a lot of Scripture growing up, maybe you were a part of a, a Bible program as a child to learn Scripture, one of the verses you would learn is what? The Word of God is like a, what, double-edged sword, right? The Word of God is like a double-edged sword. That's immediately what I thought of. I bet you did as well right? That's what Hebrew says, 4 verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and of marrow, and he is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Remember, the word of God is one that cannot be separated from the person. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What is the Word? It's Logos. It is God-breathed. It's a reflection of God's character and nature. It's how man can come to understand that he is, he is lacking. He has no ability to appease a righteous God through his own works, but only through faith and repentance and trusting in Christ. And the righteous life of Christ being imputed or credited to our account. His life is credited to our, our account as though we lived his sinless life. And our life was credited to his account on the cross, our sinful life, as though he lived it, but he did not. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might what? Become the righteousness of God. There's a transaction that took place. It's the... Uh, imputation of the righteous life of Christ credited to my account. That's why Christ had to come and live for 33 years, not 33 minutes, not 33 hours, not 33 days, not 33 months. He lived for 33 years so he could live a human life, fully God, fully man, and then that righteous life, that sinless life, could be credited to my account through faith and repentance as though I had lived a sinless life, but I didn't. And my sin was credited to him as though he had, but he did not. That's why it says, he who knew no sin became as it were sin. He's the sacrifice, the sinless Savior who laid down his life as remission or payment for my sins. And all we have to do is accept it through faith. Just like the thief of the cross, he had no time to go to church. He had no time to give. He had no time to do good works. He just simply believed. He believed this was the Son of God. He believed that what he had done was indeed sin, that he deserved yet even to die on that cross. But he acknowledged the fact there that this is the Son of God. He does not deserve to die. This is the Son of God. And he acknowledges his sinfulness, his need for the the Messiah, the Savior, the perfect Savior, the sinless Savior who did not deserve to be hung on a cross. And he believed by faith. And Christ told him that day, surely you'll be with me today in paradise. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful thought for those of us who know him? Because life is not promised to any of us next hour, Tomorrow, next week, next month, next year is not promised to any of us. But is it wonderful to know that for the believer 
The moment we leave this mortal body, we will be present with the Lord. This is what Christ said to the thief on the cross. And so as we desire to know more about God and his character, his nature, and how to have a relationship with him and how he would have us to live, we study his word, which is God breathed. So we cannot separate the person of God from his word. And the word of God is indeed like that double-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and marrow and joints, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now look at this. And his countenance was like the sun. His countenance was like the sun. Again, if you have studied the Bible for your adult life, maybe again if you were blessed to be born into a Christian family, a Christian home that took you to church, as a child you learned about the burning bush, Moses and the burning bush, right? You learned about Moses and his encounter with God on Mount Sinai and the receiving of the Ten Commandments and the countenance of Moses having been in the presence of the glory of God. We have many other examples in the Scripture where Christ is, or God is seen as a bright light. Saul had that Damascus Road experience, this bright light, the voice of God, God the Father. And so as you study the Bible, you probably think back in your mind about various passages that would be relevant with what John is saying here. His countenance was like the sun. Sure enough, look at Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Now, this is the Mount of Transfiguration. This is a fascinating passage because we're about to see, again, Jesus, but not in his earthly form. There's going to be a transfiguration, and, and the disciples, a couple of them, a few of them who become the apostles, see him as John is seeing him now in his resurrected body. Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. So he took these three. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. There we go. And his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. But Peter didn't want to leave, did he? And one day, you and I will get to glory, get our resurrected bodies, and we'll never have to leave the presence of God. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, which while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, hear me. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. This is before Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. He gave them an insight, these three, into the resurrected Lord. Now John, the revelator in the island of Patmos, has been transported, if you will, in a spiritual Miracle, truly a miracle, going against the known laws of the universe. Oftentimes, by the way, people say it was a miracle. <laughs> uh, well, what they're really saying is it was remarkable. It was pretty incredible. But a miracle, folks, is something when described in the Bible is beyond the known laws of the universe. 
And that's what John has experienced, a spiritual miracle and being transported to see something miraculous that's not normal. And he's seeing the resurrected Lord just, again, as described in Matthew chapter 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration. And notice their response. They fell down as though they were dead. They're fearful. We're supposed to have a fear of the Lord, a respect, an awe, a reverence, right? Where is that today in our homes and in our churches? Where is the reverence and fear and awe of the Lord? Our, our society, so many, what do they do? They take the Lord's name in vain. They blaspheme the name of the Lord. There's no fear. That's the one of the things I just cannot tolerate is to hear the Lord's name taken in vain, to hear people use the name of God or Jesus Christ's name as a curse word. There, there needs to be a reverence and an awe and a fear of the Lord. And these guys dropped to the ground as though they were dead because they had a fear. They were before a holy and righteous God. As they were there seeing the resurrected Lord and hearing the voice of God the Father. And John pretty much had the exact same experience. Look at what it says. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as, as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. Isn't that, again, what we see throughout the scriptures? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. This is another wonderful promise for those of us who are Christians. We don't have to fear. The Lord is our shepherd, I shall not want. Whom shall I fear? Many wonderful promises here for those who are in Christ, who are believers, but also a fascinating look into the resurrected Lord. Let's go back to the text. I am the first and the last. We're hearing that again, aren't we? He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. He's eternal. I am he who lives and was dead. That's right. He died, didn't he? He died a physical death on the cross. Fully God, fully man. He died a physical death. But guess what? He's resurrected. And he says that I am he who lives and was dead. And guess what? He's never going to die again. There's no reason for him to ever die again because he paid the price for sin once and for all. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And then he says, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. What does this mean? Let's go to what John Wolford writes about this. He says, this is a statement of Christ's sovereign authority over both physical death and life after death. Because Christ alone holds the key or authority over death, no one can die without divine permission, even though afflicted by Satan and in, tri in, trial, and tr in trial and trouble. Another typo. Should be trial, not trail. In trial and trouble. A word of comfort still all suffering believers. A word of comfort to all suffering believers. Notice what he says there. Christ holds the keys. No one can die without divine permission. Even if you're being afflicted by Satan. Doesn't that make you re re be reminded of Satan going to God and asking for permission to try Job? And what did God say? I will give you permission to do that, but you cannot touch him. Meaning what? You can't kill him. Another, another promise tonight is that God holds your life in his hand. Your days are numbered. My days are numbered. He knows exactly how many days my life will be. He rules over all life and death. He holds the key. And in fact, at some point in this study, we're going to see that hell is opened up or the pit is opened up and demons are released on the earth. 
We also know that there are, as the epistles talk about, demons that left the natural order of things that are bound in eternal chains. God has the authority over demons, over Satan. They cannot touch us unless he gives them permission. He holds the keys. So many wonderful promises in this text tonight. Write these things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So he says to him, write these things down. Write them down. And of course, he was taking down basically dictation. And he was writing in the language and in the manner of which he himself, John, would understand. When we get into various texts, it's going to be very difficult to try to figure out maybe in some areas what he's describing because John doesn't have a word for nuclear weapons, for nuclear weapons. He doesn't understand rockets, propulsion. John doesn't understand helicopters and many of these other things, but he is writing the best he can in the language that is familiar to him and describing as it's being given to him in the best possible way that he can with his own vocabulary. But it'll be pretty easy for us, for the most part, to figure out what he's talking about. We have a few where areas where we don't really know, but nothing major. We're, we're going to be able to figure out the main points of this book. And even many people say, oh, with the book of Revelation, it's impossible to understand that book. It's too much symbolism. But you know what? Already tonight, we have seen what? Seven lampstands, which we've already been told are what? Seven churches. And we're going to, we've already been told that there are what? Seven stars. And you know the text tells us as well what those are. Seven stars are seven angels. What does that mean? We're going to get to it. So, but you see, Scripture, interpret Scripture. Oftentimes, as we study the Bible, if we read a little bit further, we can know exactly what's being described. Revelation 13. Revelation uh, 17, excuse me. Revelation 17. If you go over there real quick, I'll give you another example. Revelation chapter 17. We see... In Revelation chapter 17, where it's describing verse 9. No, go to go to verse 9. Yeah, Revelation 17, verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Hmm. Was that the seven mountains of Rome? Well, that's what some would teach. Well, wait a minute. You don't have to go there. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. Oh, wait a minute. The text tells us. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, the woman being Babylon. And, and there are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other is yet to come. The five nations that have come before John is writing, the one that is Rome, and the one that is yet to come, the revived Roman Empire. You see how we just could just reading the text, not just ripping one verse out, reading the text, the text will tell us. But a lot of people say, oh, you, you can't know. There's too much symbolism. Well, m there are a few places we're not sure what's going on. But for the most part, for the major doctrines and things being taught in this book, God in his grace, the Lord God in his grace, Dictating this book, this revelation to John, has him describe it to us. If we'll just be diligent to study. And that's, again, one of the things this, about this book. It's a blessing. A blessing comes for those who seek to understand it. It takes a little work. It takes a little dis deciphering, if you will. But it's clearly understandable and that we're going to find out. The seven lampstands, there are seven churches. The seven stars, they're angels. But what kind of angels? Let's keep reading. The mystery of the seven stars. Here we go. Which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. Pretty clear, right? 
Now, what is this, the mystery of the seven stars? What is this all about? Look at Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12. Is this talking about angels like guardian angels? Now, I believe that the Bible tells us there are angels who are uh, given um, charge over us. More than that, it's not a suggestion, it's a command. God has commanded his angels to watch over us. Is this talking about these kind of angels, like guardian angels? I don't think it is. I don't think it is, and I'll tell you why. But listen, do I believe that God has angels that are watching over believers, the church, ecclesia, called out ones? Absolutely, I do. Look at, again, take hope in this. Look at Psalm 91, 11 through 12. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And in other words, even in small areas, lest you dash your foot against the stone, even in small areas, these angels are watching over you. They've, they have been given charge over you. In fact, it even gets better than that. As I said, it is a command of God himself. Look, Luke 4, verse 10, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. Look at what Robert, well, well let me just stop before I go there. Before I go to that great quote by Robert. Now, I don't believe these are angels when it describes these seven stars or seven angels because the in the original, the word for angels there is messenger. Now, how would these seven angels be giving a message to the various churches? What are they, manifesting themselves and speaking to them? No. We don't see that anywhere in the text. How are the seven angels bringing a message to the various churches and the churches throughout the church age? We have to be very careful. We don't want to get involved in Gnosticism, the worship of nature, the worship of angels, I should say, the worship of angels. Part of Gnosticism involves the worship of angels, and many people today do that. There's a proper and biblical understanding of angels, and there's an unbiblical belief about angels. And we have to be very careful. In fact, we're even told in the scriptures and the epistles to be very careful not to worship the angels. But there's nowhere in the, the text of this book, nor in the Bible, where we, the New Testament church, get our information from angels as far as the study of the Word of God or extra biblical revelation outside of the completed canon. We have the completed canon. And we have now the ministry of the Holy Spirit to help us understand these things. And we have gifted men who are teachers of the word. So this should, clearly isn't angels giving these various messages to the church. That doesn't really make sense at all, does it? But when we understand that the meaning, <laughs> excuse me, the meaning of the word in its original is a messenger, could it be that these are pastors? Well, some teach that. Interesting enough, many of the people that teach that are themselves pastors. <laughs> I guess they like to think that these seven stars or seven angels in God's right hand, the right hand often meaning a place of prominence. And I guess as, as, as many, many pastors are ridiculed and called many things, uh, being called an angel and getting this place of honor, I could understand why they may want to believe that. But I have a hard time believing that the seven angels are seven messengers of the seven churches, and they get a place in God's right hand of honor, because we're going to find that a few of these churches are really, really lacking. In fact, in Laodicea, this is a church that Christ refers to as wanting to vomit them out of his mouth, and he's on the outside knocking on the door. And again, these seven churches are representative of how the, we'll find various churches or Christians are individuals in the church age. Some saved, some not saved, some apostate, some laboring and truly believers. So are we to believe that the pastor that oversaw the church of Laodicea is one of these seven in a, the right hand of God, in a place, uh, the right hand of God, the, the Lord God, the God-man, and that are in a place of, he's in a, one of the seven in a place of honor in the right hand, I mean, would you really honor a guy leading a church that God wants to vomit out of his mouth? That doesn't make sense to me, does it? Not to me. By the way, at the time John is writing, did we have individual pastors? No, we had a home churches. We didn't have bishops. We didn't have 
individual pastors. We had a plurality of elders and teachers, and most of them were meeting in homes. You see, the modern church has largely, about 200 years after the resurrection of Christ, do we start seeing church buildings pop up. I'm not against people having a church building, but I'm not a big fan of multi-million dollar church buildings. I'm not a big fan of the idea that one man leads a church of two, three, four, five, six thousand people, and everybody hangs on that one individual's word. I think that's very, very dangerous. And we have seen men who have done a wonderful job in their ministry and life, and they have led these churches, and they die, and the next guy comes in, and what? He destroys it. And if they had, instead of having five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people in one building and one campus, instead if they had planted churches all throughout the area, when that one man passes away and the next guy comes in and he ends up going astray and destroys the whole ministry, that wouldn't have happened if they hadn't put all their eggs in one basket, if you will. If they had gone out and planted churches. So I'm not a big fan of multi-million dollar buildings with thousands of people attending and everybody hanging on that one individual's word. I'm in favor of more of what we see in the Bible, small assemblies and a plurality of elders. I'm not speaking against any pastor. My friend, Dr. Andy Woods, has a wonderful church in Texas outside of Houston, Sugarland Bible Church. It's not a mega church. They're running probably four or 500 people. Um, and frankly, in this day and age, you're going to be hard-pressed to find probably that many more people in an area wanting to hear uh, the verse-by-verse -verse Bible teaching, the uh, dispensationalism, uh, the accurate Bible teaching of someone like Dr. Woods. So I'm not against someone having a building and a pastor and a church. And of course, Dr. Woods would be in favor of the plurality of elders. When he's not there on Sunday, he has men that are capable to open the Bible and teach the, with their plurality of elders. But let's bring it up to today. As these seven churches represent the church age, where are we at with many of our churches in America and around the world today? Who, who is giving much of the truth today? Are the, is, are the Christians, the flock, the sheep being fed largely by these mega churches and mega pastors? No, no, not at all. They become very man-centered, big corporations with big staff. In fact, I had some friends over for dinner last night. Uh, they're old enough to be my parents. They're uh, in their, the two gentlemen are each 80 years old. And we were talking about this very thing. And we were discussing the fact that m many Christians today are not getting their regular Bible teaching of truth from a local New Testament church because many of these churches have become like Laodicea. They've become cold. Many today receive Bible teaching through pastors and ministers who are online through the technology of the internet. And so as I was thinking about this passage, I thought, I don't think it's angels. Angel, the church getting their, their, their a message from angels, because again, the word angels, the seven stars are seven angels. The word angel, the original means messenger. We're not getting our information or our messages from angels. We have the word of God and the Holy Spirit. I don't think it denotes pastors of churches or the pastors of these seven churches, because again, why would you have these seven pastors, all of them there in the right hand in the place of honor, when you certainly got the church of to see, he wants to vomit out of his mouth. You know what I thought? I thought, to me, I bet you this is messengers, as in apostles, little a, little a apostles, messengers, are sent ones who have gone out into the world to proclaim the truth. I bet is it is in this church age that we're in now, as things are about to unfold with the book of Revelation, where you have many of these churches that are not teaching the truth, and you have more and more messengers popping up, particularly with the ability of technology, to be teaching people around America and around the world, even as I'm doing tonight. And so I thought, I bet you these are messengers that God sovereignly raises up to teach. He always has his people. He always has his man, our men. He has his messengers to teach. And sometimes they're not the so-called pastor. That pastor is not a shepherd. He's a hireling. But God raises up his messengers. And that's what I was believing the text to be describing. And then I went to see what Robert Thomas had to say. Here's what he said. 
are men who are representatives of the churches, but are without a unique leadership function. He said, this is possibly men who are representative of the churches, but are without a unique leadership function. The plurality of leadership in local churches of the New Testament era militates against singling out a single leader who could have borne the sole responsibility for the behavior of the whole church. No individual officer could have been directly responsible for so much. What is the church again? It's not your 501c3, nonprofit, multi-million dollar building. The church is those who are called out, saved ones, ecclesia. Look at what he goes on to say. The view that, that takes the Again, typo, sorry guys. The view that takes the word for angels as men who are representatives of the churches but are without a unique leadership function appears to be the most probable choice. Angelos, maybe I didn't spell it wrong. The view that takes that these, this word angels or angelos Angelos, I think should be an N in there, but whatever. The, the reality is the word in the original, meaning angels, means messenger. And Robert's saying the view that takes this word as being messengers, meaning men who are representatives of the churches but are without a unique leadership function, appears to be the most uh, probable choice. So here's the question I have for you tonight as we get ready to close. Are you a messenger? If you have a lacking in New Testament churches in your area, or there's a lack of leadership in your New Testament church. Are you volunteering to teach Sunday school? Are you volunteering to teach a Bible study, even hold one in your home? Are you willing to be a messenger within the church age? And so many churches are failing to produce and have good godly leaders. Let's go back to the text as we quickly close. The mystery of the seven stars, we figured that out, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. Well, we know what those are. J. Bern McGee says, the seven candlesticks which thou savest are the seven churches. The English word candlestick should be lampstand since it holds lamps rather than candles. It represents the seven churches of Asia, as we shall see. Then in turn, these represent, listen, this is the key part, these represent the church as a whole, the church as the body of Christ. So what do the seven lampstands rep re really represent? The church and the church age. The church is through the church age. And, and what is the church to be? Light. What did Jesus say? I am the light of the world. And then as we receive him as our Lord and Savior, and, he, and we are possessed by the Holy Spirit, and we are believers, then what? He goes from saying, I am the light of the world, to saying what? Ye are the light of the world. See, the church, Ecclesia, called out one, believers, we're to be a light to the world, like a lampstand. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, put a candlestick and give it light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So what have we learned tonight? We've learned a few things in closing that I, sh I will share particularly these three points in closing to, con to encourage you. Don't be afraid. We're going through difficult times, folks. And Christ, the Lord God, said to John, as we saw him say again and again in his earthly ministry, do not be afraid. Believers, folks, we have passed from judgment into life. We have nothing to fear. They can kill the body, but they cannot kill our soul. You're kept. He has the keys to life and death. He's risen. He's defeated Satan and death. And he's alive forevermore. So do not be afraid. He said, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Folks, we serve an eternal God that defeated the curse of sin and death. What more could we want? And then we saw that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands, which you saw are the seven churches. And folks, I ask again, are you a messenger of God? Are you shining forth light as a member of the church? I could see a called out ones. You should at least be showing forth light. Maybe you say, well, I'm not, I'm not a messenger in that I'm not a, a teacher. No, I'm not a teacher. Okay, some of us are called to be teachers. Some are called to be evangelists. Some use your spiritual gift for the ministry of, uh, of um, mercy and help. But we all are to be light. We're all to be shining forth light as members of the church.
Well, tonight, I hope you've been encouraged by our study. As we will pick it up, Lord willing, next week, and we'll start delving into chapter 2. And we're going to start looking at these seven churches that are representative of the various churches and Christians you'll find through the church age. And then it's going to pick up steam real fast as we study the book of Revelation. So tonight, we looked at what? The Redeemer. Revelation revealed to us the Redeemer. So I hope you've been appreciating this study. Remember, we started out, we started out with lesson number one, and we looked at what? The relevance of Revelation. Two, we looked at the rewards of Revelation. We did that with lesson three as well. Lesson four, the reveals of Revelation. And tonight we looked at the Redeemer of Revelation. If you appreciate our broadcast here each and every Sunday night, and remember it's also posted at worldviewtube.com, worldviewtube.com. If you're going to watch it on the replay, you'll find it there. If you appreciate all that, we appreciate your support. wvwfoundation.com, wvwfoundation.com. Thanks for watching. Till next time, I'm Brandon House. Take care.